It is time to go deeper in God's Word. It's time to engage in truth. Here is Dr. Steve Ford and Pastor John Bornshee. You're listening to Engage in Truth, and we are so happy that you've joined us today. This is Steve Ford, your co-host, along with Pastor John Bornsheen, Senior Pastor at Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Today is our third episode in a series of broadcasts with our guest Bob McCord on what Pastor John has called the fingerprints of God in Holy Scripture. You can find the prior episodes as well as other helpful information archived on the church's website at calvaryfountain.com. As we continue to dig deep into Scripture, let's remember the words of Jesus in Luke 11, where he said, Which of you shall have a friend, and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Pastor John? Oh, thank you, Dr. Ford. Well, it has been a lot of fun the last couple weeks to be able to go deeper into God's Word. And it's so fitting since this is a program entitled Engage in Truth. And so often what we've done is really tackled some tough topics and subject matters here on the broadcast. In fact, for many years, we were just going through the Bible verse by verse. We've talked about things like the New Jerusalem, the Millennial Kingdom, even hitting tough subjects like the rapture and when and timing and so forth. And we've had a lot of fun going over these many subject matters. And over the this week and over the next few weeks, to come. We're really going to get into how the Bible was put together. But before we do that, we thought it would be fun to really get into some of the details of Scripture that are often overlooked. Things that really, as we just read it in our English language, for those of you who are listening, and maybe you're somewhere in the world right now where your primary language is not English. But no matter what, as we read the Bible with that core language that we're familiar with. Sometimes we can miss some of the beauty that's even unleashed, unraveled right before us in other languages, such as the original language of Hebrew and Greek, and and, and really explore it even deeper. And that's what we want to do here today is just go a little deeper from our conversations over the last couple weeks where we explore the Bible even further to see that with every word, there is numerical, mathematical perfection. And there are other codes, if you will, that are unleashed unleashed where one word can point to the entire plan of God. And we'll do that here today as we look at the very first word of Scripture found in Genesis 1-1 and how the whole plan of God is unlocked from Genesis 1 all the way to Revelation 22. Only the Holy Word of God can do that. So we have a very special guest in the studio who's been with us the last couple weeks to help just blow our minds as a man who loves going into God's Word would do. Bob McCord is back with us, and Bob has a passion for God's Word. Now, I jokingly last week called him a physicist, and I have a whole list of of adjectives, if you will, that I could put before his name, that he is someone who loves the Lord, goes deeper into his word, but he is really just a, a man who's passionate for truth. And and Bob, before the program, we were talking about this, that you, even in seminary, just found such a love for God's word that it just opened up for you like a book, if I can yeah, use that pun. Yes. Uh, but Bob, <laughs> welcome back to Engage in Truth. I'm excited to hear what you have to share with us today. Thank you so much, John. I'm excited to be here. Well, you uh, gave us a whole list uh, over these last few weeks that I know that our listeners probably just eager to get right back into. And I want to give you as much time to share with our listeners as possible, because we only have just a couple more subjects to cover before our in-depth study of God's word of how the canon was put together. But as I just intro this, the Hebrew language is such a critical language. We look at the the even how the language itself changed and how some of the lettering changed. You gave us a class to the men's study group not long ago and showed the the way the language has changed even over these many 
centuries. I mean, we know that Hebrew was originally in its in its form somewhat lost, if you will. I I, I try to use that word tongue in cheek. It wasn't truly lost, but certainly changed yes. during the Babylonian captivity and Aramaic came on the scene and some ancient Hebrew was still spoken, but it had changed a bit. And now the Hebrew language is back and millions are speaking the language again. And some of the root is still there. It is still just as powerful. when We go back to some of the original meanings. So tell us a little bit about this. Tell us a little about the, the beauty of the Hebrew language as we even see it today. Sure. So the Hebrew language is very unique uh, in, in any language. Um, it actually, if we just start out with, where do we get our English word for alphabet? And that's from the first two letters of Hebrew, the Aleph and the Bet. So we have the alphabet. Um, they have 22 alphanumeric characters. Um, each represents both a letter and a number. They're phonetic like English, but the ancient Hebrew script was also pictographic like Chinese. Mm. Um, and what I mean by pictographic is they were a picture. So you like, uh, if you look at the Aleph, for example, the Aleph, the ancient picture was an ox head, but there's a deeper meaning that goes with that. And the deeper meaning for the Aleph is a strong leader or even God. Um, when letters are combined together, they form words, obviously, but they also form a con concept. So as an example, the first letter we said was the Aleph. And the second letter is bet. When you combine those two together, you get the word for father, ab. And the word ab means the strong leader of the house. So that's the concept that you get from the combination of the letters, which we don't get in English or, or most other uh, languages. Um, they also, if you think about the 22 and you, you look into 22 in scripture, 22 is a representation of both completeness and order. Um, so you'll see places like uh, Lamentations where the order is very important. And when the order gets mixed up with those letters, it shows that something is amiss. Um, so th those are just some intros to how those things are important. Um, and then if you use those concepts when trying to understand different aspects of the Bible, uh, something like as simple as God changing the name of Abraham, uh, he was Abram and his name mm -hmm. was changed to Abraham. And Sarai was, her name was changed to Sarah. So God added an H to both of their names. And why is that important? Um, from one aspect, you can look at the Tetragrammaton, which is God's name, yod heh vav -Hey, And you can say he's got two H's in his, in his name. And mm -hmm. he gave one each to the father and mother of the faith, symbolizing a closer connection to God and to share in the divine calling. But even deeper than that, the letter H can mean behold. If you look at the old picture of it, um, there's, it looks like a man holding up his arms. It can also mean uh, breath or spirit. Uh, so like God did with Adam, he literally breathed the Holy Spirit into Abraham and Sarah, divinely transforming them and giving them a new name, a new life, a new purpose, and a new covenant. The fact that the H is added to their name shows that the Spirit of God is dwelling with them. Mm, amen. You know, I, I I don't know if you have any thoughts that I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, yeah. but Bob, we do read in Revelation that even Jesus says that you, he will mark us with his new name, right? Yes. which it blows my mind. I think there are yeah. 256 names for Jesus that are outlined throughout the scripture, at least, and many of them describe his attributes. And that seems to be what the names do. They do. They describe yeah. the attributes, the character as God looks to the heart of the individual. He sees who they become. He already sees the finished work. He is the right. potter. We are the clay after all. We'd expect yeah. that. But yet the Lord also has a new name that he marks us with. And that's just, right. I, I, what, did you have any thoughts on I, that? I too? would expect <laughs> that new name will be unique to each of us and yeah. describe our relationship with him. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So it just shows, I just love that. I, you know, I know that when I gave my children their names, initially it was because i liked the name right. later on as i had more children it became something that was more indicative of something about their nature and and so we were a little more patient about how we named the latter of children the lord gave us sure. and and yet what we found is that even the original names that we gave to our first two children it's just because we liked the name and didn't really think about the meaning and and their attributes and their character and so forth involved in that their name still fittingly fit their character. God right. already had his hand on that. And I praise yeah. him for that. Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, I know that with my mom, when she picked my name, there was meaning behind it. It meant right. something for her. even my middle name she picked because there was a reason for it. But I love how the Lord just so in just beautifully, precisely names us 
with his own attributes, with his own character, with his own finished work in mind. It's just something beautiful. I love that. And there's <laughs> going to be deep meaning in that new name. Amen. Amen. Well, keep it, keep going. You've sure. got so much more to cover. And I know this time will get away from us because as you talk about just their names, I know Psalm 119 has an acrostic. Tell us a little bit about that. Cause that is really comes forth in, in the Hebrew alphabet, perhaps even more because we see that as we open that chapter, you'll see each of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet there. And then there's something about that letter that's characterized in Psalm 119. So talk yes. to us a little bit about that one. Sure. So some Psalm 119 is all about the Hebrew alphabet. There's mm-hmm. eight verses committed to each letter in alphabetical order. And these verses correspond thematically to the pictorial and symbolic perspective of the letter. So an example is verse 129 through 131. Is all about the letter pay Mm -hmm. and pay is a picture of the mouth. So what we expect to see is something about the mouth in those verses. So if you look at, we'll just take three of them. Uh, Verse 129 says, your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, therefore my soul keeps them. The entrance of your words give light. It gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and panted for I long for your commandments. So you can see testimonies and words and mouth all Mm -hmm. have something to do with the mouth. That's a, it's a wonderful study. I encourage everybody to go back, reread Psalm 119, and you just see already as you go through that, what you may have just thought, well, this is something about, well, there's a letter that maybe is ahead of this paragraph and not realizing the correlation between, behind the deeper meaning of that letter. There's a mathematical value. There's an image behind it. There's a, a whole list of attributes behind each of those letters as well. And Psalm 119 captures it beautifully. So again, yeah. there's part of the Bible code that comes out that why every letter matters in a name and even in the, each sentence structure is there for a reason. And that's why those Bible codes are so deep. Yeah. And what you'll see throughout the actual original um, scrolls is you're going to see a lot of things that people will think are mistakes, but they're not. They're anomalies that God puts there for us to think deeper about them. Mm -hmm. So you'll see things that look like misspellings. You'll see large letters. You'll see small letters. You'll even see upside down letters. Mm -hmm. Um, A specific example that we can use is uh, looking at the supposed anomaly found in Genesis 2, 7, where God is forming man out of the dust. And the word formed is vietzer. And if you look at Genesis 2.19, when it talks about God forming every beast of the field, Vietzer is spelled with one yud, as it typically is through scripture. And yud is a picture of a hand in the ancient pictographs. It's also a picture of a deed, um, so completing something. Uh, but Vietzer, when God is creating man, actually has two yuds. And that's confused a lot of people. And there's a lot of depth to that, but at a minimum... It means that God took special care when creating man using both hands and one hand to create the animals and the birds and everything else. Mm. Wow. That, that's, well, we could probably do a whole program on that too, because yeah. that is just astonishing that just even in this one word, you see the very plan of God, the intimacy that he has with man. I know on Sunday, we talked a lot about that of when he spoke and created the animal life on the earth. He speaks over the land and he creates that relationship of animal life with the land. And same thing with the fish of the sea and the fact that he speaks over the sea to create. He does all the creating, but he outlines the jurisdiction of that which he has created just in saying what he said. And with man, he speaks to himself. So the intimacy is already there. Let us create man in our image. He doesn't speak to the land or the sea or the air. He speaks to himself and that intimacy that was always to be and and obviously is part of this whole plan and we see in hebrews as well that the lord bore that burden until the cross that he would be able to give us life everlasting so just the fact even in the word structure i just my mind is blown i love this keep keep going (laughs) sure so uh another example is if you look at the hebrew language in the modern language there's five letters that have a final form and those look different and they're they only appear that way at the end of a uh of a word Mm. um and so if you look at actually Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, what we see is, uh, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and that his name will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So the word increase um, is, has a unique aspect to it. And it's got a final form mem at, in the middle of the word. And so we have to figure out what does that mem mean and why is it different? Why is it unique in that situation? And the letter mem 
is closely related to water. If you, if you imagine our modern M looks like water, it looks like waves on the water. The ancient mem also looked like that. So, um, it also has a numeric value of 40, like the 40 days and 40 nights that rained with Noah's flood. So again, there's a connection of water. Um, and it's also related surprisingly to the womb. What happens after, uh, well, when you're about to give birth, your water breaks and there's a 40 week pregnancy. Um, so we also see the connection to 40 and the connection to water. Mm-hmm. So the closed mem, um, is believed to mean a closed womb and an open mem is an open womb. When that mem is closed in the word increase, what it tells us is this person that's going to be a wonderful counselor, mighty God, uh, and the ever- everlasting father is going to come from a closed womb. Mm. And so that really puts to bed the idea wow. that, uh, you know, the, the virgin birth is just a young woman. This is actually something that's embedded in the text to show us, no, this really is a virgin birth. Mm. Wow. That is incredible. You know, let me just pause here. If if you just heard that and everything and your mind is reeling with, I got to listen to that again, please go to calvaryfountain.com, re-listen to what you just heard. And if you'd like to reach out to Bob, we will connect you and he can get you even more detail on this. Because here we're talking about just the, the very structure of a word has painted the picture of even the virgin birth. I mean, this is unbelievable. It is I amazing. love it. And let me just give you an example of one word that I absolutely love the meaning of. If you take the, again, we talked about the yod heh vav heh. That's the, the name that God introduced himself to Moses. And what does it mean? We said the yod is like a hand. The heh is like behold or the spirit of God. The vav is a picture of a nail. And then there's another heh. And what that actually means is uh, the hand behold, the nail behold, or behold the hand, behold the nail. And this is reminiscent of what Jesus said to Thomas when he said, look at the, na- the, the holes in my hands. Mm. So way back when, the name of God was a picture of Jesus' sacrifice. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, we'll keep going. There's a, I know the time will get away from us, and there's even more here. And I, I hope that as our listener is just going, wow, I knew it. I knew there was more than what I'm just reading even at the surface level, which is still powerful. I mean, not undermine that at all. When we read this in English, it's still just as awesome or whatever language we're reading it in. It still is awesome. But this just really hopefully just opens the mind even more. (laughs) So let's talk about the first word in the Bible and the first word in Genesis. Mm -hmm. Um, And that word is breshit. Um, But before we dig into that, I want to read Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times Things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Mm. So Isaiah says that God declared the end from the beginning. Um, The beginning of what? The beginning of time, the beginning of scripture, Mm -hmm. but also the word beginning. That word is reshit. And and the first word in the Bible is breshit. And so the bait in front of the reshit just means in. So it's in the beginning. So, um... Basically, Isaiah is saying he's de- declaring the word or the end from Rashid. Um, and literally, God is saying that we need to look at that word because he's declaring something. He's declaring the end from that first word. Mm. So let's take a look and see if that's true. Again, if you look at the first letter, bait, it's a picture of a tent and re- represents a house or a dwelling. Um, and again, it also means in when combined with uh, the beginning of a word. You might ask, who is in the tent? So that takes us to the resh, which is the second letter. Resh can symbolize the head, a person, or a prince. It can represent the primacy, the source of something. Um, Mm -hmm. And if you actually put uh, the the bait and the resh together, you get bar, which is son. So Jesus called Peter Simon bar Jonas, which is Simon, son of Jonah. The very first completed word in the Bible is nested together in the word brashit. So the word is the son. And he is a, the son of God. Mm-hmm. Uh, therefore, the first word is the word of God. And of course, uh, John five thirty nine says, uh, Jesus says of himself, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. And again, from the very first word of the Bible, nested in the first word, you talk about the son. And of course, John says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word right. was God. How exactly. Fitting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
And so the son is in the tent, or maybe he's leaving the tent, but whose son is this? And that takes us to the next letter, and that's the LF. We talked about the fact that the LF is a picture of the ox, symbolizing strength, power, and leadership, uh, the strength uh, or the strong leader that guides and protects his family. Uh, as the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, it also signifies the number one, the first, the best, and ultimately God. Um, also, one signifies unity. We know that God is one, and that's a unity. And a deep study of that will sh- show that it's actually a tri-unity. And as we talked about last week, it's the bride price. The Aleph is the bride price, as discussed before. So the son is first. God gives authority to the son, um, just like in Matthew twenty-eight eighteen, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So the son The prince belongs to the triune Aleph, the strong leader, the first, the guider and protector, and the son is in or he's leaving the tent. Mm. But we also have another nested word here, which is the Beit Resh Aleph, means bara. And bara means to create. So the prince, the son of the father, is the creator. He's the creator of the tent, and in this context could also be the dwelling or home of all that's created. The next letter is the shin, and this is an amazing letter. It looks like our W, but in the ancient pictograph, it looked like teeth, and it symbolizes to consume, press down, crush, or destroy. Um, It carries deep significance, and it's also a signature of God uh, to a lot of people. Um, You'll find it in words like Shaddai and Shalom. Uh, It can symbolize God's ownership or something with a signature. This creates actually another nested word which is the letters resh, aleph, shin. Mm. And that forms the word resh. We saw that earlier. It's the same thing. It's the prince or the head. Um, so <laughs> the aleph and the shin also um, form another nested word, meaning fire. So the prince is coming out of his tent. He's coming to complete the shin, to crush and destroy, or to be crushed and destroyed, maybe both. Mm. And as we find out, it is both. So um, he'll also be consuming by fire. We know that happens in Revelation and to those that experience the second death. Um, And finally, we know that God is a consuming fire. Mm -hmm. Um, The shin is associated with the the number 300. And if you look at the picture of 300 throughout scriptures, if you look at Noah's Ark, the Ark was 300 cubits. If you look at Gideon, um, he had an army of 300. And even the, uh, the 300 denarii that were paid uh, that j- for Jesus' uh, costly perfume in Mark 14, 3 through 5, it was 300. All of these are a picture of supernatural victory over death. So let's go to the next letter, the Yud. We've talked about this several times. The smallest of all letters, the picture of the hand, it symbolizes the ability to accomplish something, a great deed. Uh, in this context, the prince, the son of God, the creator is leaving his home to accomplish a great deed. It's the 10th letter symbolizing perfection or completion. So this work is going to be perfect and complete. And then we come to the Tav. The Tav is a picture of the cross. Symbolically, it means a cross, a mark, sign, or seal. um, And it's associated with truth and completion. So the completion of the great deed will result in a sign, a mark, a seal, and a cross. Um, And going back to the shin, it can mean to press, which means pressing his hands on the cross, uh, which will also be a great sign, mark, and seal. Mm -hmm. So another interpretation is the Son of God is destroyed uh, and provides supernatural victory over death by having his hands pressed to the cross. It could also mean the Son left his dwelling place with the triune God to be placed on a cross. Another level is a statement of the initiation of existence or the beginning of creation. It could be read as the establishment of the universe as a dwelling place, which is the bet led by the head prince, um, the, you know, and Mm -hmm. the strength and the primacy of God culminating in the supernatural victory. So the other interesting thing, and I know we're short on time, but the resh is a name of the Messiah. Mm. So when you put the bet in front of the resh, what you get is in Messiah. The whole Bible is about being in Messiah. And that's true. I mean, from the very first word, all the way to the very end, it's always been about Jesus. Yes. Always will continue to be about Jesus. In fact, we won't even need an S-U-N anymore because it'll only be the S-O-N. Right. Who illuminates everything. So, yes. uh, Bob, thank you. And we want to thank you for listening today 
to engage in truth. And again, this has been a three-part series that you can find at calvaryfountain.com. And we're just getting started because next week we kick off a new series on how the Bible was put together, why we trust it as the infallible and errant word of God. So again, we want to thank you for listening to Engage in Truth. This is a broadcast of Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley Church. You can learn more at calvaryfountain.com. And services are 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. on Sundays. And we'd love to see you there. God bless you, my friends. Take care.